I, I have this thing where like my bike, as I said, has personalities. So when I'm trying to start in the morning, there's always a process. You never put your gloves on, you never put your helmet on, you don't even often load it up when you're trying to start it. So I find if you you load up, you put your gloves on, you put your helmet on, you put your sunnies on, well, she's not gonna start. You can't put pressure like that on an old bike. Uh, my name's Jonathan Gibson from Sydney, grew up in Brisbane. I'm currently riding my uh, 46 year old Enfield from Sydney to London. It's a 350 bullet. I left in March last year. It's February now. It's February, yeah. Um, basically, I'm riding the same make and model motorcycle that my grandfather had at my age. My, I'm the fifth generation to ride Royal Enfields right back to, to 1912 13. We've got photos of my family on Enfields. And so I thought I'd try and take this old leaky Enfield and, and see if I can make it to London on, on a motorcycle that most people would consider inappropriate. Why the fuck would you do that? <laughs> I always joke, I wish I was into knitting. My life would be so easy. Like, I'd have clean hands, I'd be warm, I'd have money. Unfortunately, it's motorcycles, man. There's something about, about motorcycles. And if you, you want a true motorcycle experience, as in a motor and a cycle, so when you're riding something, you feel like you're riding a machine. Not not, not a train, not something smooth, nothing perfect. And the joy of these old bikes is when you sit them and you open throttle, they shake, they don't break, they don't corner particularly well, but they're just a whole lot of fun. And at the end of the day, if you're not having fun, what the fuck are you doing, you know? What did your dad say about this? My dad asked where he went wrong in life. Um, he, like, my dad's always had like a, a love-hate relationship with my relationship with motorcycles. He rode Harleys and like those those lethal cow triples in the uh, the 70s, which he were known as widow makers because they were just the H1, 2, and 3. Just stupid, stupid motorcycles, you know, back when the engines were way more powerful than the brakes. And so when I was 17, I was like, Dad, I'm gonna buy a bike. And he's like, son, you're not buying a bike. I'm like, Dad, I'm buying a bike. And he goes, all right, if you're gonna buy a bike, I'll come with you to help you out and kind of walk you through the process to make sure you don't get ripped off. So I've had bikes since then. Uh, 11 years later, I kind of, floated the idea, I was like, Dad, look, I'm, I'm not really happy with my job. Just came out of this relationship, thinking about kind of doing this uh, this big trip. He goes, oh yeah, because I've ridden around South America. He goes, are you thinking about doing India on an Enfield? I go, yeah, probably via Asia, then on to, to London, through the stands in the Middle East. And he goes, yeah, radio. Um, and then his reaction afterwards, like, maybe I could join you for part of that. And so, yeah, the, the old man joined me from, from Brisbane up to, to Darwin and then had to kind of turn around, which I think to this day he kind of struggles a little bit, you know. I got on a boat and went to Southeast Asia and he went back to Brisbane in his job. So, yeah, it, yeah, my father's relationship with me and my motorcycles has been interesting. It's like he, I think he's aware, particularly because he used to ride them, just how dangerous they are. And motorcycles are a dangerous way to get around. I think he knew, though, that reality is five generation of riding motorcycles. Yeah you know, it's gonna happen. You know, I'm gonna get on a bike and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ride it as much as I can. Tell me about your grandfather and his love for the 350, specifically against the other motorcycles in that time and the 500. Yeah, so my, my grandfather, man Isaac, he used to run uh, and be involved in this group that used to put on stunt shows uh, or races and they basically called them Jim Carners. Now in the Australian Outback, this is in Mount Isa, they'd kind of set up a race course basically between trees people would race around between the trees and my grandfather when I was growing up used to talk of this almost mysterious you know godlike motorcycle the Enfield 350 which at the time uh, in the late 50s was the pinnacle of, of motorcycle engineering and he's had friends with aerial four squares his friends had a five his friend had a 500 Enfield bullet as well and he goes oh look and he used to kind of I don't know what, what his what his angle was but he goes look the mate on the 500, yeah, he'd take me on the straights, but you give me a few corners, pff, didn't stand a chance, mate. Didn't stand a chance. And uh, he's getting on a little bit, but he still likes to talk about this this old 350 Enfield. So kind of growing up with those stories, you know, uh, for me it was like, well, if I got an opportunity to ride a motorcycle across the world, taking the same motorcycle that he used to ride when he was my age, that was just a that was a huge appeal. I like that story as I reviewed the footage last night. So what about your relationship with the Royal Enfield 350? Start with um, how you're riding the same as your grandfather at that time and what your experience is on this bike. 
I think, uh, I mean, obviously you've talked about previously the, how in India, Enfields are kind of like a religion. In Australia and probably the States and elsewhere in the world, they're seen as a very niche bike. They're seen as a, a temperamental bike that's used to be English, now made in India. I kind of, I've always really liked old bikes. I've always had this kind of thing for them. And honestly, the, the Enfield was a perfect goal for me purely because it's very easy to work on. And mostly you can also still get parts for these bikes. You can still, I mean, there's a group in the UK who still make Enfield parts for basically every single model that was ever made. Yeah, you pay for it, but you can still do that. You don't have to go hunting through barns. You don't have to kind of go trawling eBay with all your notifications set up. You log onto a website and you can basically build a brand new motorcycle from new made parts. And so I mean, people go, oh, it must be really difficult to do this other bike, but this is probably the only old bike that you could comfortably do this trip on because if it does break down, which being a 46 year old motorcycle, it's a 46 year old machine that it hasn't been laid up in a you know, a museum or a barn, it's, it's been ridden every day. There's fatigue, the metal's tied, so it does break down. It does leak oil, it does blow heads and bottom ends and the bearings get fucked, but that's, that's just part of riding motorcycles. And for me, the Enfield provided an opportunity, one, I could learn how to wrench on it because it is a simple engine, and two, I knew that I could still get the parts for it. Does the name Royal Enfield carry charisma or some seduction to it? There's yeah. something about it, isn't it? Yeah, I like the, the old kind of English angle, you know? Like the, the English heritage packed into a motorcycle, sent to the new world, that is no longer such a close part of Mother England. You've got this... Uh, mystique sounds like such a wanky word, but this kind of air about this motorcycle that has this, this image of people crossing subcontinents, Himalayas, right through to the Ton Up Boys, blasting their old continentals around the, uh, the islands. And the fact that you can still get on these motorcycles and still ride them today, that's... Shit, why wouldn't you want to? Up quite a bit, she? I'm up to, uh, at this moment, Breakdown 74. Now, I call, I mean, it's a maintenance heavy bike. All old bikes are maintenance heavy. So I call a Breakdown something that keeps me for more than an hour or that I have to dive into my parts bags or mechanics for. If I can fix it, whether it's just a, a points adjustment or a air fuel mixture, screw up on the carb, that's, that's not a Breakdown. That's just a little, if I can fix it with zip ties, that's not a Breakdown. Yeah, so I'm up to 74. So I'm on my third top end, second bottom end, second gearbox, fourth clutch pack, second primary chain, uh, second rear tire, new front end. Yeah, new wiring, third headlight. I've had my six levers. I don't have lever protectors, which I probably should. Levers are cheap and protectors are not, so no brainer. Um, yeah, look. You're going to have to sell us as to why that's all worth it. Yeah, and look, I mean, if you, if you don't like getting involved in motorcycle, sure, there's a lot of people who do these kind of trips on the, the new bikes. I've got friends who, he, he did 250,000 Ks on an XT. He changed the oil a couple of times. Oh, and like, and look, that, that's fine. Like you meet these people who do the Sydney to London trips in three, four months, and that's fine. But I mean, what do you, what do you see? You, you see the highways, you see some beautiful roads, you see the inside of a lot of petrol stations. That, that's great, but to be honest, I have the most fun when I'm hanging out in a workshop trying to communicate that my points need to line and I need a point zero two feeler gauge to adjust my points because my tools got knocked off. For me, that's, that's far more enjoyable than some of the best roads in the world. Sinking beers with builders that I've met purely because they've seen me pushing my bike on the side of the road opens up to a whole new adventure. And look, if this trip was about the perfect engineering, if this trip was about, you know, breaking land speed records, you wouldn't take these bikes. This trip is about me having fun. This is about me finding a, a part of kind of my heritage combined with the bike's heritage and, and having fun. And look, a lot of people don't look being on the side of the road having fun, but as I said, the amount of people I've met purely because I've been on the side of the road, with the tool roll out, I mean, the universal bike of code, if someone sees you on the side of the road with the tool roll out, they'll stop. Even if they can't help, they'll say, look, I know somebody can, or go check this place out, or well, there's a campsite around the corner, there's cheap beer around that corner, the essential things that you need, you know? Um, 
And yeah, I think a lot of people who do these big trips, they, they miss out a lot of that. They've seen, they've seen the countryside, they haven't interacted with it. If you want to interact with people, take a bike that forces you to do that, which, mm. look, that's what the Enfield does. So Better or not, worse. You're not punishing yourself. No, like, you, I mean, this isn't some kind of like Zen, Zen approach. It's more just, I knew that if I, if I had no issues, one, I would have just blasted through these areas. I can keep riding, I'll keep riding. When you're kind of forced to pause, you're forced to kind of slowly absorb your surroundings because of the nature of the bike, and you do that. I mean, my bike doesn't have a high top speed. Once again, that forces you to kind of step back and take in your surroundings, enjoy the entire experience a lot more than you would if you were sitting on back of a 1200 blasting at 150k an hour, you know? Mm. Tell me about the guy that ran the shop floor in Chennai and had your head off in... Yeah. Uh, there's a guy who has a shop outside the Enfield factory. He's the, the gentleman who did the rebuild of my motorcycle in Chennai. And this guy was basically on the floor for many, many years at the actual factory. Now just basically does this shop. Now, look, I, I know my way around the engine a little bit. I'm not the most mechanically inclined, but look, I can, I can watch YouTube videos. I can read the workshop manual. I can spin a torque wrench. So when I was doing this rebuild in when I was pulling the head off in near Darwin, it, it basically took me the better part of two hours to, to drain the tank, pull the head, pull the piston, give it a full inspection. This guy, when I was speaking to him, he just starts working on the bike. We're still having this conversation. He's not even looking at what he's doing. And I thought, this is interesting. I'll see how long it takes him. I'm cognizant of how long it took me. 12 minutes. Two hours versus 12 minutes. And he wasn't even looking at the bike. He was literally talking to me, wrenching, you know. Oh, we'll do this, yeah, we can, we can fit this, we can make this happen. 12 minutes. I mean, the guy's obviously been working on these bikes for his entire life, and I think that's the... That, that's, that, that's why India has Enfield, that's why they keep having Enfields, purely because you've got these guys with this experience and this knowledge that they've lived and breathed these motorcycles for so long that they can fix them without even looking at them. Can you speak at all about the feeling that this engine gives you along the way? The good times, the bad times. We spoke about the simplicity of the design and how it is convenient or inconvenient and what that's afforded you, but can you tell us, can you give us a, a verbal sense of feeling about this machine? <laughs> yeah, the, the Enfield long stroke thump. There, there's no other real sounds like it. And, and emotion's a strong word, but the vibe you get when you open the throttle and you feel that piston bouncing up and down, and you feel literally every single thump, every, every time that spark fires, you are a part of that. And as you move forward, the bike will rattle, the bike will shake, the bike will spit oil out at you, but it's, at the end of the day, you're moving forward, and you know why it's moving forward. You know why it's moving forward, because you've had the engine out three days ago, because you're working on it. And there's, there's something really essential and something really tactile about that feeling that when you do open that throttle, you hear it, you feel it, and you know why it's going forward. And it's going forward because you've kept at it. You haven't, you've, you've made that bike go further. And I, I feel there's very few other bikes that kind of provide that stimulant feeling, whether even if you aren't working on the bike, every single spark that fires, that thump, 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 it increases as you kind of shift through the gears and, and mash your foot down, hoping for the best. Right. Do you meet a girl anywhere? Meet a girl anywhere. Right, my bike is way more popular than me. Like, if my bike was on Tinder. <laughs> um, yeah, look, the people are always like, you're doing a big trip, you're going to take the pillion seat off. You put more luggage. I'm like, hey, I'm riding a motorcycle and I can't put someone cute on the back. What's the point, you know? like. You, you need to have that seat. It doesn't have to be comfortable, but it has to be enough to go when she, some girl at a party or bar goes, can you take me around the block? You don't even hesitate. You go, yeah, I've got a seat, sweetheart. Let's do that. We'll grab a beer afterwards. I went to a, where was it? KL. I went to a party in KL. Um, I met some, some really fun people in Kuala Lumpur. I was there for a, a week. I was leaving uh, over a month later. And we rolled into this party, and there was a lot of people at this party, and it kind of, because people are smoking out on the, the curb, this kind of bike rolls in, and someone goes, they, they spot the Sydney to London plate, or they see the, 
the, the Australian New South Wales number plate on the back. And they go, oh, this is an interesting bike, can I, can I get a photo of you? Like, yeah, you can take a photo and they go, can I get a ride? And suddenly there's, uh, there's these three girls, like, oh, we all want to go for a ride. I'm like, I actually have to leave in about 10 minutes, you know, the supply demand. And I'm like, well, we'll fit three of them on the bike. So the three of them piled on the bike, we went for a ride around the block, and yeah, it was fun. Is yeah. that it? You this is where you, you lie. lie. <laughs> You're shifting legs, you lie, you son of a bitch. Uh, I just <laughs> told him to, I gave him permission. Look, the... Like, I mean... My friend always, like, there's a lot of arguments in our groups about why I got right into riding motorcycles. I think a lot of people did it because motorcycles are fundamentally cool. You know, like, you got to think about who rides motorcycle. Who have we got? We got the Fonzie. We've got Steve McQueen, James Dean. Like you've got people like absolute idols. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, motorcycles are fundamentally cool. They're stupidly large amounts of fun, and despite a lot of the plastic that goes around, they still have that bad boy aesthetic, you know. And you know, a leaky, beady old motorcycle that people know that you've wrenched on yourself. Please, as I said, if my bike was on Tinder. Oh, trouble. Do you have a message for the world? There's a there's a really good quote by Ted Simons, which I love. It goes, it's far more scary to contemplate doing something than it is actually doing something. You have to forgive me, I think I've paraphrased that a little bit. The summary of it, like, if you want to do something, it is more frightening to think about doing it. It's better just to kind of get out and do it. Once you start, once you get on the road, once you start riding, and whether that is riding or something else, how about it? Give it a crack and see where you end up. You might end up on Delhi on a, a documentary talking with a guy from New York and probably fucking sing.